March 27, 2009. In the blue-collar town of Tracy, California, eight-year-old Sandra Cantu heads home after school. The second grader makes her usual afternoon rounds, knocking on doors and looking for playmates in her mobile home park. I'll let her know you came by, okay? All right, all right. There's only a hundred people that live here, so it's a very close-knit community. All the residents here knew each other and pretty much trusted each other. Hours pass, and Sandra doesn't come home for supper. Her mother, Maria, worries. She begins calling her daughter's friends. Hi, Kathleen, this is Maria. Have you seen Sandra? No one has seen Sandra for hours. Okay. Maria always told the kids not to go outside the trailer park, and the kids never did. So when she went looking for her and couldn't find her, she knew something was wrong. Just before 8 p.m., Maria calls the Tracy Police Department. Tracy Police? Uh, well, I have a missing daughter. Okay, how old is she? She's eight. When's the last time you saw her? Oh, it was about three. She told me she was going over to this one girl to play, and she hasn't been home. And I went looking all over. There's a 72% chance of finding a missing child in the first several hours. After that, every hour that passes, it drops off. It's a statistic Tracy's new police chief, Janet Thiessen, can't stop thinking about. Though she's been with Tracy PD for less than two months, the chief is a veteran of law enforcement, and she's afraid for Sandra's life. Statistics tell us if a child has actually been abducted, whether it's a known person or unknown, the likelihood that that child will be murdered is most often going to happen within those first three hours. The police get a detailed description of Sandra and what she was wearing. They learn that Sandra lives with her mother, grandparents, and three older siblings. Everyone was home that afternoon, but no one saw Sandra playing outside. There was just one witness, a surveillance camera Sandra's grandfather had installed outside the family home to prevent vandalism. The lens captured Sandra's movements at 4 p.m., right before she vanished. Sandra had the little Hello Kitty pink t-shirt on, uh, looked like black leggings. This was the last that we knew she was in the mobile home park. So that was pretty important for us. It really helped us lock down that time frame. Investigators learned that Sandra's divorced parents are undergoing a support payment battle. Could Sandra's father have taken her? Dad had been out of the picture since Sandra was a young girl. Uh, we were able to verify that her biological father was not in Tracy at the time that she went missing. Sandra's father is quickly ruled out as a person of interest. Hours have passed since Sandra disappeared, but there is no sign of the little girl. It's the worst thing imaginable. You have this horrible feeling in your gut that something's terribly wrong and um, you don't know what it is. Maybe she's lost, facing some uh, hypothermia. We may have a child who's dehydrated, who's very hungry. Uh, if she hadn't found shelter somewhere and wasn't someplace safe, then this was not a good situation for her. A mother of two, Chief Thiessen empathizes with the family's growing anxiety. It, it's just heart-wrenching and it, you know, we, we have a job to do, we have to move forward through it. But I think uh, there's that human side of all of us that we think in the back of our mind, is this going to be that time where it's bad? As dawn breaks, 
volunteers canvassed the neighborhood, desperately searching for Sandra. We had a helicopter unit out. We were using a flare unit to check for heat sensors in the area that we were flying over. We also were going door to door, asking people in the area, checking with some of the businesses, had they seen this little girl? We were coming up with nothing. Sandra, it just seemed, had literally disappeared. With no known suspect or vehicle description, Tracy police are stumped. They issue an urgent bulletin on a missing child, which alerts the FBI's Child Abduction Rapid Deployment Unit, or CARD. Comprised of the world's leading experts on child abduction, the CARD unit can mobilize anywhere in the country within four hours. Team leader, Special Agent Joseph Brine and his colleagues rush to Tracy as soon as they get the alert. When we first responded to the Tracy Police Department, one of the first things they asked is, what are the odds of Sandra still being alive? Statistically speaking, 97% of the children who are abducted at this point in time have been murdered. But it was our job to focus both the FBI and the Tracy Police Department on that 3% because there's a chance that she is alive. For the first time in his 15-year career, Special Agent Brian gets a first-hand look at what is at stake in the video of Sandra's last known moments. To see Sandra was something, as an FBI agent, you don't see on a regular basis. And it was just something that had a, you know, emotional impact. The case hits close to home for Special Agent Todd Davis. I had three little girls that I raised, and so it's, it's very emotional, uh, particularly when you're trying to find a child. You get very focused on that, and uh, you know you forget to eat. You don't sleep when you go home. You, you, you can't get that out of your head. The FBI's first priority is questioning all the residents inside the neighborhood. They quickly realize that Sandra's popularity makes everyone a suspect. So, how was your day? Good. She talked with everybody. She always asked if she can help at the yard or um, help cooking. She liked to cook. Sandra was very friendly. Um, she had a way to just capture your heart, and she had a beautiful smile. She was always smiling. Like most of the children here, Sandra was allowed to roam free, and everyone opened their doors to the little brunette with a quick smile. The kids just would go out and play all together, and it's a small place, so we just knew that she'd be safe. Every little detail uh, sometimes will reveal some kind of pattern, some kind of uh, activity that may lead to a significant turn in the case. Sandra was in just about every trailer and she knew just about everybody. So it made our job a little bit more difficult because every trailer was now in play for us to investigate. Roadblocks are put in place around the area and all vehicles searched. Investigators have no solid leads until they get a tip from a concerned neighbor, the mother of Sandra's best friend. The neighbor sends a text message to Sandra's mother that a large suitcase was stolen from her driveway around the same time Sandra went missing. It could be an unrelated incident, but investigators are concerned. The neighborhood borders the 205 freeway, which connects the Bay Area to the town of Tracy. It would have been very easy for someone to come into this area, drive a couple blocks, see this little girl, and pick her up. If, in fact, it was a stranger abduction in that type of a scenario, would we ever be able to get any information? The FBI speculates about who Sandra's abductor might be. Our behavioral analyst unit told us that uh, we should be looking at predominantly male individuals who knew Sandra, who resided in the trailer park. So we started to look at uh, individuals who had contact with uh, Sandra over the past couple of years, uh, adult males in particular. But at this point, their profile is hypothetical and only based on statistics. In this case, we don't have a crime scene. And without a crime scene, there really is insufficient information that we can use to form a profile about what might have happened. There's one other thing the FBI profilers know is likely, that Sandra's abductor knows her well and is someone close to home. For the most part, we remain fixated on the idea that an offender is going to be familiar with the victim 
or the victim's neighborhood in some way. Tracy police detective Tim Bauer is on the investigative team. He's been to the trailer park on other cases and recognizes Sandra's family. Like everyone else, he can't rest until the girl is found. I mean, this is the type of case that you could not think about even when you're not at work. And you want to be here 24 hours a day yourself looking for the child that's missing. The FBI works with the Tracy PD to quickly put together an emergency operations center. We utilized about 65 FBI agents and about 26 detectives from Tracy PD. You'd have a whole row of uh, people that were managing the tips as they came in off three different computers. Every second counts. And investigators want as many people as possible to know about the case. Everything was such a blur. We had been talking to the media to try and get her picture out there so people were aware of her in case they saw her. We wanted our little girl home. No resources spared as searchers use helicopters with thermal imaging, dive teams, cadaver dogs, and volunteer foot patrols. Two of the largest searches for a missing person that have ever been done in Northern California's history. We had approximately 200, 250 people out searching for Sandra. A lot of the police officers told us that it was like they were searching for their own daughter. Sandra became Tracy's daughter. Everyone's hopes sink when a search team at the town dump unearths a pink shirt exactly like the one Sandra was wearing. Investigators approach her family with solemn news of their discovery. After talking with the family again, we were able to figure out that it was not the right size. It was almost that sigh of relief. Okay, we still are operating on the belief that we are looking for Sandra being alive. If Sandra is still alive, Investigators know that time isn't on their side. They pore over the last known images of her, searching for the smallest clue. She looks like she's coming towards home, then all of a sudden she turns her head to the right and heads off in a different direction from where she was coming. I probably looked at it 40, 50 times, trying to figure out what else might have happened that caught her attention. Nothing more is seen on the tape until a neighbor drives by eight minutes later. A canine unit can only track Sandra's scent for a couple of yards. We had some uh, dogs track her scent down this street. So we know, of course, she, she traveled to the end of the street up to that corner. And that's the last uh, scent that we were able to pick up at that point. Investigators interview anyone in the neighborhood who is a registered sex offender or has a criminal record. The list of persons of interest is shockingly long. Sunday. You had sexual deviants living in the trailer park, people on probation, parole living in the trailer park. You just had other weirdos living in the trailer park. In this particular situation, we try to emphasize that even though you are looking at registered sex offenders, that statistically speaking, only about 2% are going to be registered sex offenders. Doesn't mean they're not preferential sex offenders, it just means that we haven't caught them the first time and they don't have an arrest record. One person the police want to talk to is a man who two years earlier had approached Sandra at the neighborhood pool. This gentleman had brushed Sandra's hair off of her face and kissed her on the lips in the pool. Made us worry. The man admits to the kiss, telling investigators it was harmless affection. He has no prior criminal record, but makes a disturbing confession. He told us that he had sexual fantasies about young girls, that his fantasies focused on girls between the ages of 9 and 10, and so that, uh, that placed him uh, high on our list. But the man isn't the only suspicious person in the park. On the afternoon Sandra went missing, the park manager confronted an unfamiliar ice cream truck driver who was talking to children near Sandra's home. Hey, what do we have here? Can I have a chocolate bar? Sure can. They had a uh, ice cream man that usually does not go to that particular area. Aren't you just a little kid? Excuse me. Was suspicious to some of the people in the neighborhood. And what did we tell you about being in the park? And that was another lead that we had to trace down. 
Did Sandra's trusting nature catch her in the net of a predator? Sandra was a very friendly girl, but we thought these individuals might have taken advantage of her friendly personality, you know, to, to use to their benefit. As night falls, there are no solid leads. The town of Tracy gathers for a candlelight vigil. The community showed so much love and support. They left stuffed animals, hundreds and hundreds of stuffed animals they left as a memorial to her. And it was cold. It was so cold. And we just knew that she didn't have any jacket on because it was warmer during the day, but it was so cold at night, and we were just so worried about her. Investigators are there too, lending support and looking for suspects. The peaceful ceremony is shattered when a woman frantically approaches FBI agents. She's screaming, I found something, I found something. It says can too. So myself, and a couple other agents and one of the police officers, we follow after her. She's uh, still hysterical, she's still yelling, she's still screaming. We get over to where the mailboxes are in the complex and she just plops down. Uh, she points it's over there. Investigators are stunned when they read its dire message. Cantu is in stolen luggage in water at Pachetti and Whitehall, signed witness. After two days of searching, there is no trace of eight-year-old Sandra Cantu. All the FBI and Tracy California police have is a growing list of persons of interest. There were several individuals in the trailer park that jumped out at us that needed a little extra attention. These were individuals that had either been involved in drugs, crimes against children. Then, a startling lead lands in the lap of investigators. A neighbor walking to a candlelight vigil for Sandra find something suspicious in the park. I, 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 was, I was just walking by and I, and I saw it here on the grass and I... Investigators gather the note, which has a chilling message. The note said, Cantu is in stolen luggage in water at Pichetti in Whitehall, signed witness. San Joaquin County, Deputy District Attorney Thomas Testa is suspicious. And what's so interesting about this note is it almost looks like there are deliberate misspellings. I mean, a very simple word on is misspelled, and an FBI expert looked at it and gave an opinion that it looked like someone was camouflaging their writing, hiding their true writing. Is the note true, or is someone trying to throw the police off track? Investigators can't take that chance. At daybreak, agents immediately order a search of the ponds near the address, two and a half miles from the trailer park. The intersection borders a river and a dairy farm, and there are several settlement ponds for cattle manure runoff. Investigators aren't sure where to look. In the settling ponds, it makes uh, uh, extremely difficult to search because of the sewage that had flowed into those settling ponds from the dairy. It makes it impossible uh, for divers to uh, locate anything. Investigators have no idea whether Sandra's body is in the pond. They have a lot of questions and turn to the note's messenger for help. 28-year-old Melissa Huckabee is the same neighbor who reported a suitcase stolen from her driveway the day Sandra went missing. When uh, the agents interviewed Melissa at her trailer, she told them she was especially alarmed when she saw the note referencing that the child had been placed in the suitcase because she said her suitcase was large enough to fit a, uh, a child in. A friend of the family, Melissa is a single mother raising a five-year-old in the home of her aging grandparents. Her daughter is Sandra's best friend. Her daughter played with Sandra, and her family was church-going people. Her grandfather was the pastor at the church around the corner. And she was a school teacher there. So as a family, we felt safe having her there. But the agents are suspicious about Melissa's involvement. 
and dig further. Why she was not statistically, you know, the person that we profiled for this type of investigation, the fact that she had injected herself into this investigation, the fact that her story was not very credible was a concern for us. Melissa has a partial alibi. At the time Sandra disappeared, Melissa was alone at her grandfather's church decorating her Sunday school room. Phone records prove she placed a call from the church to the trailer park manager around the time Sandra went missing. Even so, agents search Melissa's car. We found a blue self-sticking note, and when we retrieved that note and looked at it more carefully, uh, we noticed that there was some scribbled handwriting. Closer inspection of the note reveals something suspicious and our evidence response team was able to isolate the scribbled writing on top and adjust the color and contrast and shading. Underneath the handwriting were three words, Bacchetti, Whitehall, and Water. The address is the same as the one written on the note Melissa supposedly found. Is she the author of the ominous message? In Melissa's messy bedroom, Agents find a notebook hidden below the nightstand. It is the same type of paper as the note, and a page is missing. It also contained on it some indented writing that we held up to an alternate light source, and our evidence response team was able to uh, discern a couple of letters that exactly match letters found on the anonymous note. Investigators are now certain that Melissa wrote the mysterious note. But why? Is this an attention seeker who somehow wants their 15 minutes of fame, or is it a situation where this person is trying to find out what do the police know and how close are they getting to me? In spite of the questions surrounding her, Melissa cooperates with police, offering valuable information about yet another suspicious neighbor. Yeah, the guy right there, he's really creepy. Every so often, Sandra would go to the man's home and play games or hang out. Do you have a deal? And he's been linked to an alarming incident with another little girl in the trailer park. That's for you. A seven-year-old child had been drugged, and he had assisted the child's mother in taking the child uh, to the hospital. And when the police arrived at the hospital, he uh, exited abruptly. That was an indication to us that maybe there was something uh, that he was hiding. Cadaver dogs search the man's vehicle and get a positive hit on the truck. But the evidence team finds no traces of human remains. And residents are coming forward with more disturbing information. Police are shocked when a stepfather and stepson who share a trailer volunteer photos they have of Sandra on their cell phones. At the top of her shorts were unbuttoned as she's sitting on somebody's lap. And the fact, of course, that uh, they admitted that she was in their bedroom frequently it was of concern to us as well. A search of their home uncovers a computer with questionable images of children and a stuffed animal used for masturbation. But the two men have no criminal history of offenses against children. By now, it's been a week since Sandra disappeared. And her once idyllic neighborhood has turned into a land of horror. FBI agents and the Tracy PD work around the clock chasing down leads. Every hour that ticks off, you feel that stress and that tension. I really literally had to order people to go home. Every second that we're sleeping and that we're not working the case, maybe that's that moment in time that if somebody was doing something on the case, that we still had that opportunity to find Sandra and to find her safe. Investigators need to narrow their list in hopes of finding a suspect. They decide to administer polygraph tests. They start with the man who had kissed Sandra at the local pool. He passes. His alibi also pans out. He is not charged. The suspicious neighbor also passes a polygraph test, but has no solid alibi for the block of time. Investigators learn he is a close friend of the man who kissed Sandra. Could the two have worked together? 
The stepfather and stepson, who were found with questionable photos of children, are also given polygraphs. The results are disturbing. Each of these individuals failed the polygraph on the uh, question of whether they had anything to do with her disappearance. But as authorities begin to move on their leads, they make a tragic discovery. The suitcase surfaces. It's been 11 days since eight-year-old Sandra Cantu vanished from her trailer park in Tracy, California. Two and a half miles away, workers at a dairy see a suitcase floating in the water. They call the sheriff, who rushes to the scene with Tracy PD and the FBI. Is she in there? We wanted to know, but at the same time, we didn't want to open at the scene, obviously, because we want to protect the integrity of what's inside. Hairs and fibers, other pieces of evidence that can link us to who did this, if this is actually Sandra in the suitcase. The suitcase does not have any identifying marks, but the zippers are tied together with a thin white string. Standing knee deep in sewage, the evidence team lifts the suitcase and places it in a body bag. Immediately, the one thing you noticed was the weight of the suitcase. Um, there was definitely something inside the suitcase. As we start to carry the, the, the body bag out, all of a sudden you could smell the smell of death. Investigators deliver the bag to the San Joaquin County Medical Examiner. He carefully cuts the white cord on the zipper and opens the case. Inside is a young girl curled into the fetal position. Dental records and her clothing confirm what investigators don't want to hear. It is Sandra Cantu. It's devastating. You know, we lived up to this moment that she's still alive. We've got to find her. She's still alive. We can find her. We can find her. And then, at this point, we can't. The only thing we can do to help her now is by finding out who did this. Sandra's body is fully clothed in the same outfit she was wearing when she disappeared. Toxicology reports reveal she was drugged with benzodiazepine, a powerful sedative. There are no obvious injuries on Sandra's body. No scratches, bruises, or cuts, except a small scrape on the inside of her bottom lip. The coroner determines that she was sedated, then smothered, before being put in the pond. And there's something else. The doctor determined that she had been sexually assaulted, and at first was kind of confused because of the angle that had been used for the sexual assault and kind of determined that it had been with a foreign object. After assaulting her, Sandra's killer completely redressed her body. What it suggests to me is that this was an individual who knew Sandra and perhaps may have felt remorse and wanted Sandra to be presentable. Special Agent Marcus Knudsen stays with Sandra's body as she is taken for x-rays and then to the morgue. Knudsen, himself a father of a young girl, can't bear to leave Sandra alone in the dark again. It, it hurts because this is a young girl. She had everything going for her. You know, why? Why take the life of a young girl? The case is now officially a murder investigation. But before authorities can begin, Chief Thiessen has the painful task of informing Sandra's family. It, it's so hard when you see something that's happened to a young child. There's no easy way to tell somebody that your child is dead. It's news Sandra's family is not prepared to hear. When they came to tell us that they found Sandra, the most primal screams that you can imagine, and wailing and disbelief, and just not wanting to, it to be true. To me, she was a beautiful baby. Just my beautiful little girl.
Once I had delivered the messages, I needed to have a few moments just by myself. Uh, th this was just so highly charged. I, ha I had to take a few minutes, and I'm sure that there were uh, a few tears that escaped. And then it's back to take that deep breath and back to the job at hand. Now we had a killer to find. Authorities know the killer is on the loose and could strike again. And the messenger of the note, Melissa Huckabee, is now their prime suspect. Now that we found the body described in the note and the type of suitcase matched the suitcase that had been supposedly stolen from Melissa's trailer on that day, that uh, certainly pointed in, in her direction. Investigators want to polygraph Melissa, but they can't. Melissa is in the hospital after attempting suicide by swallowing razor blades. Agents don't know what to make of her erratic behavior, but they do know that something is up. The signs of swallowing the razor blades, the note, I don't know if it was guilt or just wanting to get attention, but she wanted someone to come talk to her about Sandra Kent too by all of her acts that she did. Investigators begin gathering evidence against Melissa Huckabee. They question her family and learn that Melissa has a dark side. Three months earlier, she pled no contest to petty theft charges for stealing from a department store. Two years before that, in her prior home in La Palma, California, there were two mysterious arson fires. Though Melissa was a person of interest, charges had not been filed. Melissa was mentally unstable and medicating herself for relief. She was bipolar, depressive, uh, had high anxiety. She was dependent on drugs to deal with her emotional situations, frequently overdosed on those drugs. Only three months before Sandra vanished, a parent in the trailer park accused Huckabee of taking her child to a local park without permission. When Melissa brought her home, hey, sweetie, I have some special juice for you. The girl acted strange. Drink it up. Her speech was slurred. Don't worry about the smell. That's really she good. was unable to control her muscles, kept falling down, and was drowsy. The girl's mother and her boyfriend rushed the child to the hospital. Tests revealed benzodiazepine in her bloodstream. Melissa denied harming the girl, and charges were not filed at that time. Agents hope that this time, Melissa won't be so lucky. They get a break when a local Marine is able to place Melissa where the body was found. We located a witness who lived on White Hall Road who was heading to a restaurant to eat that evening with his uh, wife and uh, he noticed an SUV, a small SUV, that was parked facing west on the uh, north side of the road with a car door open. The couple stopped to check it out. Then, Melissa emerged from the ditch. Basically, they saw her coming up from the pond, they engaged her in conversation, and were able to provide the exact time this was based on where they had eaten that night for dinner. It described her to a T, it described her vehicle to a T. The timeline fits, but it's only circumstantial evidence. And investigators need irrefutable physical evidence. They get a warrant to search Melissa's grandfather's church. We conducted a search of the church looking for any cordage that would match the description of the cordage we found on the suitcase. And we found a blind in the Sunday school room used by Melissa that had been cut and retied. Investigators are also looking for the object Melissa allegedly used to sexually assault Sandra. We covered the church head and toe with alternate light source, um, looking for bodily fluids and blood. In the kitchen, they find a bent rolling pin. And the rolling pin had one side that had a red smudge on it. So they collected it with gloves, of course, put it in a bag, and tried to find fingerprints on it, and collected that smudge. Now, agents have to wait for the crime lab to do its work. They want the case to be rock solid before they make an arrest. They won't have that luxury. 
Five days after entering the hospital, Melissa Huckabee is released. Her daughter and grandparents have left town, and her house is empty. Police wiretap Melissa's phone. The next day, they hear a phone call that stops them in their tracks. She asked for Sandra's sister to come down and play with her daughter. Hey, Maria. Yeah, I was wondering if your daughter could come over and play with Mike. Clearly, the concern for the Tracy Police Department okay. and the FBI was that Melissa Huckabee was now asking this girl to come down so she could kill this young girl just okay. like she had killed Sandra. April 10th, 2009. Two days after she is released from the hospital, murder suspect Melissa Huckabee invites her victim's older sister to her house. She says it's for a play date, but FBI and Tracy California police fear she has sinister plans. Well, here we go again. She's going to try to pull this off again because in her mind at this point, she believes she got away with it. Unaware that Melissa is suspected of murdering their daughter, Sandra's family is about to send her sister over to play. My boss says, hey, get over there right now. Drive as fast as you can and get there. And right before you get there, shut your lights down and get in there and then just walk up like everything's cool and knock on the door and make sure we don't got another little kid in there. Detective Bauer races to Melissa's house, fearing the worst. And we get over there, we knock on the door and when Melissa answered the door, there's a neighbor's daughter in there who our surveillance units thought might be Sandra's older sister, but, you know, fortunately it wasn't. Trying to act casual, he convinces Melissa to come down to the station for a formal statement. I mean, you can look at this as like a, a game of cat and mouse. We let her believe that she was one of the early rounds, but we knew the ultimate goal for us was to, one, get a confession out of her, but two, to get her to understand that we knew and we had evidence to show that she was solely responsible for Sandra's death and assault. In the interview room, Detective Bauer confronts her with proof that she forged the note about the suitcase. We took a normal, you know, three-inch blue sticky note, and we blew it up on graph paper to the size of this wall right here. And it had the three words on it that were scribbled out, Bacchetti Whitehall Water. And the person wrote this note, and it had to be the only person that knew where Sandra was. Melissa denies everything. After five hours, Detective Bauer confronts Melissa with the evidence that cracks her lies wide open. Between 5.30 and 5.40, two people saw your car stopped on Whitehall Road. They saw you come from out of the bushes on Whitehall Road, and someone asked you what? <laughs> when I was, I was okay, and I said I was going to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. What were you doing, Melissa? <laughs> it was an accident. I told you it was an accident, I know it was. <laughs> Accidents happen. Kill her. <laughs> Melissa claims Sandra's death was a horrible accident. A misguided game of hide and seek with Melissa's daughter. Melissa says she became distracted and forgot about Sandra in the suitcase. She drove to her Sunday school room at the church and began working. Melissa claims she tried CPR, but it didn't work. She zipped the girl back into the suitcase and decided to hide the body in the pond. Melissa denies sexually assaulting the little girl. But her partial confession is enough for Tracy PD to arrest her for the murder of Sandra Cantu. 
Investigators tell Sandra's family the stunning news. We felt very betrayed to know that it was Sandra's friend's mother who did this. Forensic tests on the evidence from Huckabee's home and the church confirm what investigators already know, that Sandra's death was no accident. Reports reveal that the metal rolling pin in the church kitchen contains traces of Sandra's DNA. Sandra had never been in that church, so her DNA should not have been on that. So it was a real powerful piece of evidence. The cord from the blinds in the church are compared to the string on the suitcase. The laboratory came back with a report indicating that that cordage was the same size, color, dimension, and substance as the cordage found on the suitcase. Analysis of Melissa's home computer suggests that Sandra Cantu's murder was coldly premeditated. We found an article detailing the murder of a child, and that child had been murdered by her grandfather and placed in a suitcase, and the suitcase had been thrown in a river. Based on the evidence in this investigation, it appears that this was premeditated, and it was a, a sad opportunity that presented itself, and she took advantage of it. The forensic evidence is the final piece of the puzzle. Authorities use it to construct a timeline of what happened to Sandra, beginning with the surveillance tape. At 4 p.m., Sandra walked off screen in the direction of Melissa's home. Sandra, come on over here with me. Come here. You want to help me decorate the church? Sure. Okay, come on, let's get in. Eight minutes later, Melissa's car drove by. After driving Sandra to the church, Melissa gave her a drink laced with benzodiazepine. Almost got it ready. Thanks. Go ahead, drink it all out. When the girl was unconscious, Melissa made her move. Around 5 p.m., phone records show that Melissa made a call from her grandfather's church to the trailer park manager, reporting her suitcase stolen. She started thinking of needing to cover her tracks by making sure she reports the suitcase that has Sandra's body was stolen. So if a suitcase is found, she could claim, well, someone stole it and someone else must have put the body in it. Then, shortly before 6 p.m., the eyewitness saw Melissa near the pond. Hey, Sandra Cantu was dead before her mother ever called 911. May 10, 2010. Faced with overwhelming evidence, Melissa Huckabee takes a plea deal and admits guilt in the kidnapping and murder of Sandra Cantu. All other charges are dropped, including charges of drugging and rape. I think that's a testament to the strength of the case and to the credit of the detectives and the FBI is that she probably thought there was no way out. She probably would have been given the death penalty had the case gone to trial. Melissa is now serving life in prison without parole. When asked why she killed Sandra, Huckabee has no answer. She never would tell me why she did it. To this day, she still says, I don't know why I did it. She knows why she did this, and she just won't tell anybody. We don't care. I don't care to know, because it's a sick individual that would do something like this to a child. We view Melissa as a monster. Monster. Female child killers are rare with less than 10% of murders attributed to women. If a female, as an offender, is engaging in some type of sexual assault on a victim, there might be an emotional aspect that comes into play as well. And we can be talking anger or rage or revenge or, or some other negative emotional state. Authorities speculate Melissa Huckabee may have killed out of jealousy 
that Sandra was stealing her own daughter's affections away, or out of a need for attention and praise. I still cannot understand why I did what I did. She created the emergency, and she was going to be the one to solve the emergency. And she would be the hero. She would get all this attention. She'd be the star, and she'd be on these TV shows, and Oprah would come and talk to her. So there is that theory that this was just a cry for attention. Sandra Cantu may have walked off camera, but she will never walk out of the hearts of those who caught her killer. It's a tragedy that someone so little, so cute, had her whole life before, would lose her life. She didn't put herself in harm's way. Evil came and sought her out, and that's a clear tragedy. Our team is still going to hurt over the death of Sandra. You know, you take somebody in the community that you think is, you know, a good person or respected, and they turn out to be like Melissa Huckabee. Yeah, it's just, it's hard. It's hard because it could be anybody. Who's, who's the next Melissa Huckabee?